Our friend Levi Losco tells a story about looking for seashells at the beach with his daughter. Levi was looking for all the perfect shells, you know, the ones with no broken places in them whatsoever, while his daughter Clover, on the other hand, was just picking up every piece of shell she could find. And whenever her hands were as full as they could get with the seashells, she looked at her dad and she said, Dad, the broken ones are beautiful too. And that's really what I want you to hear today, that the broken ones are beautiful too. That in God's sight, what is broken actually can be quite beautiful. And that's good news for you. I don't know if you know that or not, because the Bible tells us we're all broken, right? Psalm 14 verse one reads something like this. It says, there is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there was anybody who understood, who sought after God, and yet they've all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul wrote it this way in Romans 3. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul says, everybody, all of us fail. We sin. We're all broken. Now, my failure may not be your failure. Your sin may not be my sin. I may look at stuff you're tempted by and go, uh, why are you even tempted by that? You may look at stuff I'm tempted by and go, what are you thinking? But the truth is, all of us are tempted in some way. All of us sin in some way, and we're all broken. Now, the Bible is full of stories of broken people who failed publicly or privately. Some failed, you know, uh, simply and some failed spectacularly. Maybe you've seen the list that floats around from time to time, you know, online. Noah was a drunk. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all lied repeatedly. Joseph, when he was younger, was arrogant. Moses and the apostle Paul were both murderers. Samson battled with uncontrolled lust. Rahab was a prostitute. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Isaiah confessed he had a dirty mouth and unclean lips, he would say. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was mad at God and bitter toward God. John the Baptist and Thomas both doubted God. Martha worried about everything. Come on, I got any Marthas out there? Jesus said, you're worried and bothered about so many things. Got you tied in knots. Martha was a world-class worrier. Mary Magdalene had a bunch of demons inside of her. The Samaritan woman had been married and divorced five times, was living with man number six the day she met Jesus at the well. And Matthew and Zacchaeus were both greedy, cheats, tax collectors. All these people were broken, and yet because of God's amazing grace, they were declared beautiful in God's sight. And that's good news for you. That's good news for me because of God's grace. Our failure doesn't have to be fatal. The Bible says all of us have sinned, and the wages of sin, what we ought to get for that is death. But praise be to God that he gave us Jesus. And this week marks the beginning of Holy Week, one of the most sacred and holy weeks of the year for you and for me. Today is Palm Sunday, where we remember that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, presenting himself as king of peace and our perfect Passover lamb who came to lay down his life to pay for your sins and mine so that death might pass over our house so that you and I might live. By his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, now you're forgiven and set free. But listen to me, apart from Jesus, apart from faith in Jesus, you will die in your sins and be separated from God and Jesus and love forever. But because of Jesus, your failure doesn't have to be fatal for you, and it doesn't have to be final. By God's grace, you can rise up and allow God to write a new chapter, heck, even a whole new book, a whole new story with your life. Now, nobody's failure in the Bible is any more public or well-known than Peter's. And so if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 14 today. Many scholars believe that Mark actually wrote his Gospel based on the reflections of Peter. The, the assumption is that they met whenever they both were in Rome and that, Paul be, uh, that Peter began to speak and Mark began to write. And so he gives this Gospel account based on Peter's reflection. And he gives us a glimpse in Mark 14. He gives us a glimpse into Peter's worst moment ever and how it even came about. But in the end, God brought beauty out of brokenness. Please hear it again. In the end of Peter's story, God brought beauty out of brokenness. And he wants to do the same thing for you today by grace. And so with your finger right there in Mark 14, can I just lean in with you just for a second and say, y'all, look, come in, bring it in. Let's bring it in. We're bringing it in. Hey, listen, God really wants you to know how much he loves you today. He really wants you to know that no matter what's happened in your life, no matter what you've done, he loves you. 
and his grace and what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago is enough for you. And if you really want to experience grace in a new beginning, would you just, with, with faith as a mustard seed, which means there's a lot of belief and a lot of unbelief, would you just whisper under your breath, maybe in your heart, and just say, God, I really need you to talk to me today about grace. I really need grace, okay? This story in Mark uh, 14 begins with Jesus and the disciples in the upper room. This is before they go into the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas is going to ultimately betray Jesus. While they're in the upper room, they've just had communion. Jesus drops a bomb right in the middle of the room. He says in verse 27, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus says, tonight, all of you guys are going to fall away. The Greek word transliterated is scandalized. The, the, the meaning of the Greek word fall away means to cause a person to begin to distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. In the coming hours, Jesus knew that the disciples were going to be scandalized. He knew that he wasn't going to do what they wanted him to do and expected him to do. These men, please put yourself in their position. They believed, they had bet their lives on the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. He's the one that was promised in the Old Testament, the deliverer of the people of Israel. He was going to throw off Roman oppression in their minds and he was going to give them their lives back, lives of freedom. And they had literally gone all in, leaving everything to follow Jesus. So in the next few hours, when Jesus doesn't fight back, and rise to power, but instead surrenders his life in death. They're going to be cut to the core. They're going to be hurt. They're going to be confused. They're going to be disappointed. They're going to, they feel like fools because they believe that Jesus really was the Messiah. They left everything. They've wrecked their lives for him. And now this, they're scandalized. They're, they lose trust and they walk away. Now, all of them protest when Jesus said, you're all going to fall away. They all say, that ain't happening. And I think the one who yelled the loudest was Peter, because Mark 14, 29 says, Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. I love Peter. He's kind of brash, right? He's extremely confident. And I think he's well-intentioned. Peter's spirit is willing, but his flesh is weak. Anybody know what that feels like? His spirit's willing. He really wants to do well. But he doesn't have what it takes. And Jesus knows it. And so he tries to warn Peter in verse 30. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows twice, Peter, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter's like, that ain't happening. He kept insistently saying, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples were saying the same thing also. Jesus is trying to Shake Peter a little bit. Wake him up to go, bro, you have no idea. Tonight, before a rooster crows in the morning, you are going to, you're going to deny me. You're going to disown me. You're going to act like you don't know me three times. Peter's doubling down. That ain't happening. That ain't happening. I'll die with you first. And they're all saying it. Now, Peter's determined. He's confident. He's well-intentioned. But, and Jesus knows that. But he also knows that Peter is not perfect and put under the right amount of pressure Peter is going to wilt like a flower in August heat. And so he begs Peter, man, you better be praying because you're, you're in it right now. Verse 32, they came to a place named Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here until I've prayed. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be very distressed and he's troubled. This is Jesus. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Now, if you know much about the disciples, you know Jesus had 12 of them, but there were three of them that were like his boys, his ride or die. And so he, he brings those three into a private place and says, man, I need y'all to pray for me. I'm really struggling right now. Stay awake, keep watch. And I think Jesus wanted them to pray for him, but I think Jesus was also saying, man, pray for yourselves. But you know this story. You know that when Jesus comes back a few minutes later, they're sound asleep. Verse 37, he came back and he found them sleeping and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch just for an hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Peter's got good intentions. He wants to be strong and faithful, but his flesh is as weak as water. 
He doesn't have the power to do on his own what he really wants to do in his head and in his heart. Y'all ever know what that felt? Y'all know what that feels like? I mean, have you ever come to church and you hear a message about anger or anxiety? And you're like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Or maybe you've been in a small group or heard a podcast or had a conversation with a, a friend who really builds you up. And you're like, I'm going to live different. And in your head and in your heart, you really want it. And then what happens? Life happens. And next thing you know, you're back in that same old ditch. That's Peter. He wants to do good, but he doesn't have the ability to make it happen. You and I are the same way. You don't have the ability to follow through on your good intentions and your own strength. You need, this is what you need, you need supernatural spiritual help. And prayer is the way you tap into that supernatural spiritual help that you need to live the way you know in your head and your heart you want to. Be watchful and pray. When Judas showed up with the bad guys, prayer time was over and it was go time. And Peter, well-intentioned, brash, he said, I'm willing to die for you, Jesus. I'm willing to die with you. And he meant it, and he almost got them all killed. He pulls out a sword, verse 47 says, one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now remember Mark's writing based on Peter's reflection, and Peter kind of left that detail out about who it was. But John throws him under the bus. He said it was Peter. Peter pulls out a sword and he tries to kill the guy and clips his ear and Jesus heals the man's ear and says to Peter, what are you doing? Stop it. If I wanted to, I could call for 12 legions of angels, about 75,000 angels, if I wanted to, to own this. This is not my way. You see, the problem is Peter was trying to fight a spiritual fight with a sword in the flesh. And that's not how you win spiritual fights. Remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3? He says, for though we walk in the flesh, humanity, right? We walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, spiritual warfare. And here's what he's trying to say. You don't win spiritual fights by doing better. Try harder. Have more commitment. Be more disciplined. Because that's what we try to do. I got to quit. I can't look at that. I can't go there. I can't say that. I got to stop this. And you try to win the war by weapons of human flesh. That's not it. Think more like David when he fought Goliath. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, David says to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. You think we're in a street fight. You don't know we're in a spirit fight. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. David didn't kill Goliath. David would say, God killed Goliath. God gave him supernatural courage. God gave him supernatural aim and strength. And Goliath went down. David was vastly outnumbered and outarmed in the flesh. But Goliath was an easy target in the spirit. You hear me? Your battles are not won in the flesh by you trying harder, doing more, stop that, be more disciplined. That's not it. Spirit battles are won with spirit weapons. Verse 53 says that after Judas betrayed him, they led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together and Peter followed him at a distance. Everybody say at a distance, at a distance. Peter follows him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he's sitting with the officers, warming himself by the fire. Now, I got to give Peter some credit. I got to give my man some love. He's at least following, right? All the other disciples, man, who knows where they are? Starbucks, Walmart, I don't know. But they aren't following Jesus even at a distance. So I got to give him some love. He's at least following Jesus, but he's following at a distance. I, I would add a safe distance, far enough away so that nobody would think, you're clearly a disciple of Christ. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Follow Jesus on the low. Follow Jesus kind of covertly. He's following at a distance. 
right into the wrong place, right into the enemy's territory with the wrong people all around him. And that's where Peter's about to make a mess. And so I want to paint a contrasting picture. On the one hand, Jesus has been led into the place of the high priest. He's undergoing a sham trial where fake witnesses, lying witnesses who can't even get their story straight are accusing Jesus of all kind of stuff that he did not do. Soldiers are mocking Jesus. They're spitting on Jesus. They're hitting him with sticks and hitting him with reeds. They're yelling at him to prophesy. They put a crown of thorns on his head. He's bloody. In this moment, in this moment, Jesus is fighting with hell, I believe. He is in this very moment taking on and becoming what you and I deserved, sin and a curse. He's innocent. And yet here he is about to drink the cup of God's wrath, even though he doesn't want to, he's able to do it. Meanwhile, down in the courtyard is Peter. And Peter is about to wilt like a flower. Look at verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene, but he denied it. He said, I neither know nor understand what you're even talking about, girl. And then he went out on the porch. Well, the servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, no, that, that guy, he's one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders actually were again saying to Peter, hey, man, surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean too. And he began to curse. I don't blank and know him. He's swearing. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And the scripture says he began to weep. He's crushed. That rooster crowed and Peter had already laid an egg and made a spiritual mess. Now, how does that happen? How do you end up, how does he, how do you and I, how do we end up making such a mess sometimes? Well, I think if we were to go back and look at the story as Peter tells it through Mark, I think here's some indicators that you're headed for a mess. When you have pride, when your pride says, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about, that's a problem, y'all. Whenever you're telling God, you don't know what I feel. God, you don't know what I know. That's a problem. And our pride is a problem. Peter has great intentions. He meant well, but his good intentions doesn't mean faithfulness to God. As a matter of fact, his overconfidence actually made him vulnerable in the moment he least expected it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can relate to that. I oftentimes overestimate my strength and my ability to handle pressure and temptation. I think I'm stronger sometimes than I really am. And I underestimate the enemy who's so subtle at the, at the most inopportune and expected times. Christy and I were on the road not long ago, the day after my birthday, actually. And I just finished an incredible conversation with a new friend that I'm making. And man, I was just like riding high, life is awesome. And that's when my wife asked me a question and my heart sank because I knew that an honest answer would hurt her and it would expose me. Now, whenever you're put on the spot like that, your body, psychologists tell us your body goes into one of four psychological states, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. You may know fight, hey, move, throw down, right, flight, I'm running away, freezes, uh, but fawn, like what is that? When you fawn, that means you're like, oh, come on, man, it ain't that bad. And if you're a smooth talker, you can really kind of help people's anger levels come down. You can help them be more reasonable. Fawning is a real gift as a pastor when you're trying to help people who are at odds try to come together. But whenever you try as a pastor to fawn when your wife asks you a question, and now you're trying to manipulate and minimize and to distract, it's not fawning, it's lying. And so I lied. I just lied. And I know she knew, but I lied. And a couple of days later, I had to come back around to her and say, hey, can we have that conversation again? Because I want to tell you the truth. Pride can get you in a world of hurt. Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. 
It, you may have learned that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And you say, so pride leads to a fall. No, pride doesn't lead to a fall. Pride leads to destruction. It leads to destruction. And the enemy wants to destroy everything precious about you. And so if you're sitting here thinking, man, I've got, I, I, I think sometimes I think I'm stronger than I am, smarter than I am. I'm not paying attention to what's going on. Pride's a real problem. Maybe prayerlessness is another thing that, that Peter experienced that maybe you know what that feels like. Prayer is engaging with the spirit in the spiritual realm. Prayerlessness leaves you uncovered and without strength. You, you wind up living in your flesh, right? What we learned, this is what we learned from Daniel a few weeks ago. No prayer, no power. Much prayer, much power. How does Jesus, going through hell, stay faithful to God's plan? Because he was in the garden praying a lot. And so he is fortified a lot by the Holy Spirit and by angels who are ministering to him. Peter, on the other hand, sleeping, he doesn't pray. So whenever the moment of temptation comes, guess what Peter does? Wilts. He folds up like a blanket. Because when you don't lock in with the Spirit, when you don't live your life saying, God, I got to get my eyes on you, I got to have your perspective and realize what's really happening here, the less you pray, the more vulnerable you really are. Prayer is where your strength to live out what you want to live out comes from. And maybe another reason Peter made such a mess is he followed too far, right? I mean, he's pride, he's, he's prayerless, he's following too far, he's at a distance. That's the opposite of walking up close. I think you get in trouble whenever you follow Jesus from a distance and you try to play both sides and you sit the fence and you try to be with your church friends and then you try to be with your wild friends. You try to go to deacon's meeting and then you go drinking with your buddies at the hunting camp. You try to be on every side of every issue because you don't want to disappoint anybody and you wind up being thought a fool by everybody. If you've ever been to London and, you, and you've ridden their rail system, you've heard or seen a sign that says, mind the gap. Mind the gap. It's everywhere. They say it everywhere. It's, it's verbalized everywhere. You can buy a t-shirt with it. There are signs with it. It's painted on the floor right where you go from the platform onto the train, mind the gap, because there's a gap between the platform and the train. And in that gap is where you can lose a phone. It's where you can lose a possession, it's where you could lose a child or your life. And so everybody says, mind the gap. And so here's what Peter should have been minding is that gap. He's following Jesus from a distance. You need to mind that gap because what falls in the gap between you and Jesus are temptations and people and business and busyness. A lot of things fall into that gap. And so you want to close that gap. The further you are from God, the harder it is to hear him and the less confidence you have that he actually hears you. So follow him up close. Follow him close. And don't go to the wrong places, right? Peter's following from a distance and he goes to the wrong place, right into enemy territory. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time for him. There are some places that just aren't right for you. Now that varies from person to person because we're all different, right? Right? Uh, I can honestly say it is zero temptation for me walking through a casino um, to want to put money on a card table, to play a one-armed bandit, to put you know, money on red seven at the roulette wheel. That has no appeal to me whatsoever. It drives me nuts. And all that, it doesn't do anything for me because where I grew up, money was way too tight to be throwing it away like that. But for some of you, just me mentioning it, you already hear it, you smell it, and something happened in your pulse. That's a bad place for you. Some of you, it's springtime, and you're like my wife and my mother-in-law. You love going to the plant store. Oh, yeah. My heart sank yesterday. They said, hey, can we use the truck? Oh, God, no. What do you need a truck for? Are you going to buy all that stuff? Y'all know what I'm saying? Look, they ain't go, they're not going shopping. They're going to get they go going to, and they loaded up my whole truck with plants, right? I can walk through that plant store and I have zero desire to buy anything there unless it may be a persimmon tree that I could deer hunt by. But other than that, I couldn't tell you a bougainvillea from a chrysanthemum or whatever. I, I don't know, but man, boy, they're on that. That's their game. I could care less. 
but you drop me in a hunting store with Sitka gear and I will lose my mind. I will, I will just act a total fool. I, need, I definitely got to have one of that. Reagan probably needs one too. Y'all know what I'm saying, fellas? See, it varies from person to person, but you need to know where your vulnerabilities are. What are your bad places that you just don't need to go? They're not sinful to go. They're just not wise for you to go. I had a guy after the first service say to me, you know, for me, it's social media because social media can become a gateway into a whole realm that I really struggle with. And so he said, I just had to cut it out. Do you know where your weaknesses are? Are you willing to stay away from those places and just say, you know, it ain't for me. It's not wrong for you. It's just wrong for me. Are you alone? Because Peter found himself alone. He needed a friend, but he found himself alone. Somebody who could say to him, come on, man, we got this. Solomon, the wisest man ever said two are better than one. But Peter finds himself alone and isolated. I've heard that if the devil can get you isolated, he's got you half eaten. And so if you're living large chunks of your life or a particular part of your life while you're on the road for business, maybe living at home alone or in the privacy of your own room, or maybe it's you and your boyfriend or girlfriend all alone, or maybe it's just in a crowd and nobody really knows what you're really going through, can I just say to you, it's dangerous ground. You need to be known. When Peter made his mess and that rooster crowed, I'm convinced that an absolute flood of guilt and shame and condemnation and negative voices and hopelessness, it just started coming in waves and on waves on Peter. He had done the very thing he said he would never do. You know what that feels like? Of course you do. Of course you do. One of the reasons that I, I think I really like Peter is because I can relate to him. I can relate to his impulsiveness. Peter's a ready fire aim kind of guy. Peter's, a, I'm like Peter, we talk until we think of something to say. And that, that's, that's the way we are. And so his impulsiveness, Mark's favorite word, if you read the gospel of Mark, his favorite word is the word immediately. It's the shortest gospel. Peter ain't got time to fool around. It's just bam, 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 bam. I, I relate to that. I relate to that kind of impulsiveness. I relate to his failure. Doing the things I, I didn't think I'd ever do. And I relate to his personality type, which is kind of a big picture, less details kind of a guy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I can have a meeting with somebody and the meeting will be two hours long. And I come home and my wife will say, how'd the meeting go? It's amazing. What'd y'all talk about? Gosh, I don't, I don't even really know. I know it was good. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? She's asking a million questions. And I'm like, I don't know. We just, it, it was good. She, on the other hand, can recall everything and the color of the room and the way the fan sounded and what the, what the other person was wearing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Knows all the details, right? Can tell you all about it. Peter is a big picture guy, so Mark writes a big picture gospel. All Peter heard that night in that upper room was, you're all going to deny me and fall away. And Peter's like, that ain't happening. But Luke, on the other hand, is a physician. He's a detail guy. And he recounted something about that night that Peter, in the big picture way, missed. And it changes everything. It's, it's a detail that really helps us to land where I think God wants you to land today. It's an observation that says this, God's grace is greater than your sin and your failure. This is what this detail, it's what these couple of verses out of Luke's gospel about that very same incident are going to tell you. God's grace is greater than your failure and your sin. Flip over to Luke 22 for just a moment. Luke 22, 31. Jesus, that very night in that upper room, when all Peter could hear was you're going to deny, Jesus actually said these words, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He says, Peter, Satan's asking to sift you like wheat. Now, if you don't know what it was to sift wheat, they would take wheat and they would sift it so that the kernel of wheat would fall down and all the chaff would blow away. He's saying, Peter, the, the, the Satan has sought to sift you like wheat. He's trying to separate you from me. And he's saying, actually, to all the disciples, the enemy's trying to separate you from me. And the enemy's trying to do that to you. 
He's trying to get you to give up on God. He's trying to get you to believe that God's given up on you. He's trying to sift you and get you to lay down in your failures and to quit. And so he's saying to, to Peter, man, you got to know, I am, I know, and I'm, and I'm praying for you. And this is what grace does. Grace knows, grace knows. I, I read Luke's account. I read what he wrote and it occurs to me, Jesus knew before Peter ever made a mess, Peter was gonna make a mess. Isn't that crazy? It's not like, it's not like Jesus wakes up and goes, and by the way, Jesus, Peter denied you too. He's like, dang it. He knew. And so can I say to you, your choices may sadden God, but your choices will never disappoint an all-knowing God. You may disappoint yourself and you may disappoint people you love, but you will never disappoint God. He knew you before the foundation of the world and he sent Jesus to die for you anyway. He knows that's grace. That's what grace does. It's a grace that understands life is hard and temptation is difficult to manage. And compassion, he has compassion for you. There's a verse for that, Hebrews 4.15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. What is that verse saying? It's saying, would you remember that Jesus became a man? Fellas, he became a man. He knows what it feels like to face temptations with business, with money, with church, with women. He knows what it feels like. And because he knows what it feels like, he can sympathize with you and your weakness. He can come to you and go, I know that you don't have what it takes to win this fight on your own. I get it. So the very next verse says, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment, not the throne of justice, but the throne of grace. You come to God in your weakness so that you can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You come to God and say, God, I need grace. I need grace right now in this fight. I need grace right now. I made a mess or I'm making a mess. God, give me grace. Jesus, help me. And he says, you can find grace. You see, grace knows and it's there and he comes to help you. And grace prays. Jesus said, I pray for you, Peter. I've already prayed for you. Not I'm going to pray for you because how many of y'all know if you promise to pray for somebody, sometimes you forget anybody? Oh yeah, I'll pray for that. And then you go, man, you go on with your shopping and you ain't thought about it. And the next time they come to you, they say, thank you for praying. And you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right? So Jesus said, I've already prayed for you, man. I'm not promising to pray for you, although he does. He said, I've already prayed for you. And what does he pray? He says, I pray for you that your faith won't fail. He knows Peter's flesh is going to fail, but he prays that his faith doesn't fail. Can I just say to you, Jesus knows that your flesh will fail every single time. So Jesus right now is praying for you that your faith faith doesn't fail, that your faith won't quit, that if you've made a mess, you won't lay down and just say, that's it, I'm done. No, your faith needs to rise up. Faith in what? Faith in the forgiveness of Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That's what Holy Week is. It's the beginning of our march toward the cross where Christ pays for your sin and mine. And when he bows his head and says, it is finished, it is done. You're forgiven forever. And put your trust and your faith in the unconditional love of God. Well, I know God used to love me, but I don't know how he could love me now. God's grace gives you unconditional love. Romans chapter eight, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? No, go on to verse 38. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, no angel, no spiritual principality, nothing present, nothing to come, no power, light or dark, no height, no depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. God loves you anyway. 
It's undeserved blessing. God blesses you anyway. It's unconditional love. You're not worthy of love. He loves you anyway. It's grace. As a matter of fact, some people say grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. You get all the goodness of God because of what Christ did for you 2,000 years ago. And because it's grace, unmerited favor, undeserved blessing, it means you can't do anything to get it. So don't try to get your stuff together so you can come to God. Grace doesn't work that way. You can't do anything to get it. But please hear me. If grace is grace, it means you can't do anything to lose it. It means no matter what you did last night, last week, or last decade, God doesn't say, well, hate it, can't have grace for you. No, you can't lose grace. Isn't that good news, y'all? Isn't it good news to know that grace is God's unmerited favor and God, Jesus is praying for you right now, right this moment, that you would have an open heart to receive his grace. And grace restores, it knows and it prays. And Jesus prayed for Peter, once you've turned, I want you to strengthen your brothers. Grace actually restores us. He, Jesus knew that Peter would make a mess and he also knew he would come back home. He knew that he would hear the message that Jesus is alive and that his sins had been forgiven. And he would say, that's what I want. And Jesus knew that. And so he prayed, Peter, when you've turned back, when you went to church and you heard the message and you said, I'm in, and your life starts to transform, you know that God is saying to you, I want to restore you too. That's what he's saying. And he says to Peter, Peter, you made a mess, but your mess is going to be a, mess is going to be a platform for the message. Peter, you made such a train wreck, but there are going to be people 2,000 years from now who their lives have been a train wreck too, and you're going to be an encouragement to them. That's what I love about Peter, is he gives me hope. He gives me hope that in spite of my mess, I can still have a message. That in spite of my failure, I still have grace. And that you and I today can be strengthened to believe again in the grace of God, not do better, not try harder, not do more, not stop that, but to fall into grace and say, God, change my life. Your grace is greater than my failure. And God promises to help you be strong and to stand and to be firm in grace that never fails. Proverbs 24 verse 16 says, for a righteous man falls seven times. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we learned that seven was the number of completion. You may have made a complete mess, even as a follower of Jesus, a complete mess, and yet a righteous man will rise again. Who am I talking to? Who is God talking to right now? And he's saying to you, you may have made a complete mess, but you're a righteous man by the grace of God. And by that grace, stand up today. Rise up today. Don't let your failure be fatal or final. Rise up today in the grace of God. You be strong. You can be established and confirmed and renewed. And you can pass the test next time. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And you learn what it looks like to rise up and to lead. Your biggest failure could be the place of God's greatest glory in your life. Well, I've made a mess. My marriage fell, fell apart. My addiction, blah, 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 blah. That could be the very place where you become God's champion for somebody else. Do you understand that? That by God's grace, he can restore you and use you. Your mess becomes your message. Your test becomes your testimony. Your brokenness is the very place where God wants to bring beauty by his grace. I took my first ever golf lesson this week. I'm 57 and I took a golf lesson. That means I'm getting old and I ain't gonna be able to run anymore, so I'm doing old men stuff now. <laughs> took a golf lesson. Uh, there's a guy that goes to church at our Madison campus named Randy Watkins. Randy's a former PGA Tour player, and uh, he, he offered to teach me how to play golf. So I had my first lesson. And um, he put a ball on the practice surface, and he said, okay, do your thing. So I did my thing. And he said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'm trying to hit the ball. And he said, Chip. In golf, you don't try to hit the ball. Well, what do you try to do? <laughs> he said, in golf, the most important thing is for you to pick a target 
and align yourself to the target. And then you're going to swing at the target and the ball's just in the way. The ball has no idea what club you have in your hand. The ball has no idea where it's going and the ball don't care. You pick a target and you swing at the target. I realized I have played golf wrong my whole life. Come on, fellas, y'all know. I've played golf wrong my whole life. Now here's the spiritual parallel. Some of you came to church today and your life is a hot mess. And I'm here to tell you, you've been doing spiritual life all wrong because you've been trying to hit the ball harder. You've been trying to hit the ball straighter. You've been trying to do better and not do bad so much. And some days you get it right and you're like, oh my gosh. And then there are most days whenever you go, this is the most frustrating thing in the world and I just quit. And I'm saying to you, you've been playing wrong. Stop trying to do better and align yourself with Jesus and with grace. Because when Jesus with outstretched arms, said it is finished. Everything needed for your forgiveness, everything needed for you to experience unconditional love, everything required for you to have unmerited favor, everything needed for your broken, messy life to become beautiful in the hands of God was done. And so I'm saying to you, please hear me, man. Listen to me, guys. You don't need a mulligan. You don't need a do-over. You need to quit trying to play that game. Quit trying to do better and say, God, what I need is grace. I want to play the grace game. I want to align myself with you today. How do you do that? Well, you got to believe that God loves you. You got to believe he really loves you that he really does forgive you. He's a father who loves you that way. He loves you. You gotta believe that his word is true. His word is true if you'll confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what he does. He loves me. That's what he says he's going to do. But here's the gap. Most of us never say, so God, I receive grace right now. I need grace. God, right now, would you let grace wash over me? Holy Spirit, would you cleanse me? Jesus, I receive grace. Wash my sin away. Wash my guilt away. Wash this this guilty conscience and all these voices of negativity away. God, I receive grace. I receive grace. I receive my righteous standing. I receive your mercy right now. I receive your help. Come on, would you do that with me right now? Just across the room, wherever you are, would you just posture your heart to pray? And would you say, God, I have made a mess. I've made a mess with my life and I've been playing the wrong game, trying to fix it. I've always tried to do better, try harder, do more. And God, I quit. I quit. I'm not gonna do that anymore. God, I need grace. So would you just align yourself with Christ? Would you just, in your own mind's eye, would you look to Christ? Maybe you look over at the cross over on the other side of the room, but would you just align yourself with the grace of God, the proof that he loves you, he knows you, he's praying for you, he wants to restore you. And would you just say, God, I want to receive grace. Wash me, cleanse me. And would you, just, would you just do what the scripture says has happened to you through Christ? Would you just imagine him washing all your failures? As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, he removes your sin from you. He, he, though your sins are as scarlet, he washes them white as snow. Could you just envision the grace of God washing you? That's what it says in Ephesians 5. He washes you with the water of his word. God, you forgive me, and I can't imagine what that cost you. It's too good to be true, but I receive grace. Thank you, God, for grace. Lord, from this day forward, I just want to align myself with grace. And I want to pray. And I want to be humble. And I want to follow you real close. And I don't want to go to places that are going to be bad for me. God, I want to be around people who are good for me. God, let my life be a strong testimony of grace. 
just a second, we're going to close our service today. We're going to stand up. We're going to sing a song that a couple of months ago really grabbed my heart. I was at the, at the gym. I was on the stair climber, and this song came on. And I, I just, all of a sudden, everybody else didn't matter to me. With my eyes closed and hands up as much as I could, I just turned the gym into a worship center. And the song just says, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. God, I was a mess, and you came for me. God, I was a wreck, and yet you reconciled me. And all I can say to you, Jesus, is thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the blood applied. Thank you for grace. When we stand to sing this song, I'm going to have some friends at the front of the room. They'd love to pray with you if you need that. But I pray that your heart would just become a sanctuary. Don't worry about anybody else in this room. Close your eyes if you need to. Raise your hands if you want to. I don't care. But would you just say to Jesus, this holy week, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for grace. Lord, would you come and meet us now? Change us by your love and by your grace. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Come on, stand with me. Let's respond.